All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this week's virtual discovery classroom. I'm your moderator, Megan Selva, the Jill Abrahamson Environmental Education Intern, and I'm glad to be here with you again. Today, Dustin Angel, the Director of Education, will be streaming live outside in the field to give us a fun and interactive talk about native wildflowers blooming in the scrub. Again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer as many as possible. If you could put your name and city or state in the chat, we'd love to see who is joining us today. We have two special guests, two special guests with us from Archbold's Plant Ecology Lab, Lexi Siegel Bates and Lillian Fulton. They'll be helping to answer some of your poll questions throughout the webinar. Before we turn it over to Dustin, I just wanted to share with you some flowers I found outside. So I found this Rexia Mariana. Maybe some of you have seen this flower outside. It's a wetland flower. Its common name is Pale uh, Meadow Beauty or Maryland Meadow Beauty. And then I have also with me a pickerel weed. This is also a wetland plant. And it's very beautiful. I love, I love flowers. So I'm very excited about today. And I even have my flower crown. All right. So let's see what Dustin is up to out in the field. Over to you, Dustin. Hey, Megan. Hey, everybody. I was just reading the locations that the participants are coming from. And my goodness, people are coming from all over the country which is really exciting. If you're up in the cold north right now, this is, might be a little bit of what you need, a little bit of Florida sunshine. It's a gorgeous day out here at Archbold Biological Station. It's a, almost 90 degrees, so it's a little hot, but it is beautiful. My phone may overheat. If that happens, I've got a cooler here and I'm gonna plunge it right in that cooler. We have a couple of guests coming on today, so if I get knocked off, they'll jump in and take over. I'm coming from the discovery loop out in the Florida scrub. In normal times, this is a trail that's real short trail, about a 10 minute walk right next to our Francis Archbold Hufty Learning Center, uh, right when you first pull into Archbold Biological Station. Unfortunately, right now it is closed down and this is our only way to share it with you. Today, our theme is spring wild Florida, uh, sorry, spring wildflowers in the Florida scrub. Before we get to looking for some flowers, what do I mean by the scrub? Sounds kind of like a bad word, but really the Florida scrub is a very unique and interesting habitat. It's only found in Florida on Florida's ancient sandy ridges. It's a pretty amazing place but it's a difficult place to live if you're a wildflower because it is hot out here. Half the year, it's very dry. The other half of the year, it rains a lot. So you can have drought conditions and flood conditions and sometimes hurricanes and fire is a natural cycle out here as well. When thinking about wildflowers and just flowers in general, you might think about uh, having been to a botanical garden or going to a store that sells flowers and seeing lots of big blooms. Well, those places have flowers coming from all over the world, from all different habitats, from jungles and all kinds of places. When you're coming out to the scrub, you need to change your expectations a little bit. For me, I just throw my expectations out because every time I think I know the scrub, it shows me something totally different and surprises me. I'm gonna take the next 25 minutes to walk around this trail and be on the lookout for wildflowers. I've got my first one behind me right here, I'm gonna show you. And this is one of those surprising flowers in the scrub that when people visit for the first time, it can, it can really, um, really surprise them. So let's take a look at what we've got here.
Look at this beautiful yellow bloom right here. Gorgeous flower. This is a cactus. This is a prickly pear cactus. Sometimes people don't realize how, how um, far the range of cactuses really are. This prickly pear cactus here is, is down here in Florida, but it goes right up the East Coast and is even in Canada. It's actually an endangered species in Canada, though we have got plenty of them here at Archbold Biological Station and in Florida. One of the things that I think is interesting about these yellow flowers is that they don't last for very long. Every species of different is different, of course. Some flowers will last, the, the petals will last for weeks or months. These ones at Archbold, they only last for days. In fact, this flower bloomed this morning and it is already starting to end its life. Right now I can see it's starting to fold itself back up. This plant right here will grow more flowers. So it has this one on it today, but I if I come back in a couple of days, there might be another flower on here. There's something else that I really like a lot about prickly pear cactuses. I'm going to change my camera around here so you can see what I'm looking at. Just turn this around here, take a look at this prickly pear. You'll notice it you know looks like looks like a cactus right but there's something on this cactus this white gunk <laughs> this white white gunk on the cactus what do you think it is write it in the chat what could this be i'm really curious to know if anybody if anybody knows this story I could spend a long time going through the story of what the white stuff is, but I will spend a few minutes on it because it's just too cool. Bird poop, sap. Hey, Pam, got it. Cochineal. This is a, a beetle called the cochineal beetle. And what is so cool about this is it has a long, long cultural history. The ancient Aztecs farmed cochineal beetle because you can make red dye out of it. I'm going to grab a little piece here. The beetle is hiding under the white gunk. It's hiding under the white gunk there and that, that white stuff protects it from the elements. It keeps it from, from drying out and it keeps predators from eating it. These beetles produce an acid that is red and, it, and let me show you here. I'm gonna crush this. Oh, that one didn't work too well. Let me grab, let me grab another one. There we go. Look, <laughs> look at that. It's an, it's an acid that these beetles produce. The Aztecs farmed these. If if you know your American history, you'll remember that the British military during the American Revolution were called the Redcoats. And that was because they were using red dye on their uniforms, red dye made by this bug. This is still used today. There are still cochineal farms out there uh, in South America as well as other places. You may have had this bug dye on your face, or you may, may even have eaten it before. It's used in all kinds of makeup and lots of different foods. Of course, they don't say bug, you know, bug juice <laughs> when you're seeing it. They'll have, there's several different names that it goes by in the stores. A few years ago, some of the companies, um, they, they started to stop using it because uh, vegans or people who had dietary restrictions due to religious beliefs, they couldn't, they couldn't eat it. One example here is I've got some Skittles, red Skittles today are, are vegan. But 10 years ago or so, they switched their recipe. Before that, if you had ever had a red Skittle, 
that was dyed with the cochineal beetles. And, and they used to use gelatin on the insides too, which is made from animal parts. So today they don't have that in it, they don't have gelatin, and they don't have um, the, the cochineal beetle either. But <laughs> pretty cool, right? There's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people are allergic to it, but most people are fine. I've got another flower I want to show you right around the corner. This is a scrub pawpaw. There's a few flowers on here, actually. This flower and the prickly pear I just showed you, those are probably the biggest flowers that you're going to see in the scrub. Most of the, most of the flowers I hear are pretty small. Let me change my camera around again. So you can get a close up view here. Sometimes when you're looking at these, you can actually find little beetles living on them. And I'm looking around. Don't see any on these ones. I was out here about an hour ago and I did find a couple beetles. Looks like they've flown, looks like they've flown home. So there are some uh, there are some ants on there. Okay, let me switch back around here. All right, so those those are the the biggest showiest flowers that we've got out here in the Florida scrub. The next ones that we look at will be very interesting and cool, uh, but but are going to uh, take a little bit of observational skills to find. We have three poll questions for you. So we're actually gonna pull up our first poll question right now. And we have, a, we have a guest who's gonna come on and answer that question. So Megan, let's pull up that poll question about wildflowers in the scrub. All right. All right, poll question number one. Can you guess how many flower species are blooming right now at Archbold? A, less than five. B, five to 10, C, 10 to 20, D, 20 to 30, or E, more than 30? And I'll give you just a couple more seconds to answer that. All right, it looks like a little more than 30 was the majority here. Uh, our next our next guest is Lexi Siegel Bates. She's a plant ecology research assistant. She's been going to Archbold summer camp since she was seven years old and went to Florida Gulf Coast University to study marine science. After college, she decided to move back and work at Archbold to study plants. Hey, Lexi, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, everyone. It looks the majority of people said that there's more than 30 uh, flower species blooming at Archbold right now. So at Archbold right now, we actually have between 10 and 20 species blooming. So different species bloom at different types of the year, or different times of the year. And also there are a lot of factors that go into whether or not plants bloom. For example, if the summer or the winter before was too dry or too wet, or if seeds got too hot, too cold, or if plants died over the last year, then they wouldn't be flowering. So right now we have about 15 species blooming. Thanks, Lexi. I, on our trail here, uh, you know, as mentioned, this is only about a 10 minute walk out here, but I counted, I think it was maybe eight different species that were flowering out here, which, which is pretty good if we're at the short trail. I've got our next plant species here, and we are going to get up close and personal with this one, just like we did with, with the other, except this time, well, that had, that had spines on it. This one's also dangerous because this one is a saw palmetto, and it is covered with little serrations like a knife. But I'm gonna get right in here because I want you to have a good look at this. Oh, 
Oh yeah. <laughs> there we are. Here we have the flowers, the flowers of a saw palmetto. You can see me in there too. I don't know how good the resolution is because these are pretty small. But what I'm looking at here are hundreds of flowers. I'm seeing hundreds of very pretty, very just delicate, beautiful little white flowers. I'm also seeing insects. I'm seeing a lot of ants walking around all over, all over these. Earlier I saw bumblebees, or I saw a bumblebee, and I saw a honeybee on here as well. Lots of different flowers visit this. One of the things that we study at Archbold is called uh, pollination ecology. What that means is when we think about a plant and the pollinators that visit it, we don't think just about that one plant and, and just those insects. We think about all of the web of life, the, all the other connections that are out there too and how one plant is part of all of it. Over many, many years, researchers at Archbold looked at insects that were visiting these flowers. And then they counted all those species up. They had over 300 different species visiting this one, this one species of plant, which is, which is a lot. None of those species were specialized on this. That means they all visited other plants or did other things as well. So this is like the gas station of the scrub where the insects will stop and fuel up and then go about their day. This plant also produces berries and these berries are one of the staple foods for the Florida black bear. In fact, it's a very important food for the black bears. The male black bears in Florida can travel hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, uh, one male that we put a collar on, his name was M34, traveled over 500 miles in three months, traveling around Florida looking for love. And one of the things those bears will do when they come to the scrub is they're, they're eating these berries. The berries are not ripe. They'll be ripe in the late summer and in the fall. But I do, there are some little ones starting to grow. And I don't know, they're pretty small right now. You can see that in my hand. But they'll, they'll end up about this big and they'll, they're, they're green and then they'll turn yellow and then they'll look uh, basically black when they're ripe and ready to eat. I've never been brave enough to try to eat one of these. <laughs> they're supposed to taste really bad, but people have eaten them and they also are used for medicine as well. <laughs> so that's the saw palmetto flower out here. It's hundreds of flowers actually. And now we are ready for poll question number two. And we actually have another special guest to help us answer poll question number two. So Megan, let's get that up there. All right. Poll question number two. Where does the tar flower get its name? A, its flowers are often sticky from honeydew aphids. B, its flowers exude a dark staining resin. C, its flowers are sticky and trap insects. Or D, its flowers smell like tar or paint thinner. Give you a couple more seconds to answer this. And our special guest who will be helping us answer this is Lillian Fulton. She's the Vaughn Jordan plant ecology intern, and she's been helping with long-term demography projects on some of many Florida scrub endemics and was lead on a large flowered pawpaw project. Her own intern project is why tar flower, uh, Bajaria racemosa, that's a scientific name, has sticky insect trapping flowers. Uh, her passion for plant and insect ecology grew during her undergrad on the Minnesota prairie she hopes to work in plant and insect conservation. So it looked like 57% said its flowers are sticky and trap insects. Is that correct, Lily? Everyone, so that is correct. If you said that 
it has sticky flowers that trap insects. So I'm happy to be here to tell you about tar flower. So tar flower is a shrub in the scrub with hairy stems and its seeds are contained in capsules and you can see both of these things any time of the year even when it's not blooming. It is blooming very soon though. It blooms in May and I'm excited. It has fragrant white showy flowers and it also has sticky buds and fruit and outer petals that often trap many insects. So here's a little bit about what we know about tar flower stickiness. So it is as strong as commercial insect trapping glue and the petals are also only sticky on the outside so that it doesn't trap its pollinators when they land on the flower to get at the nectar and pollen. So I have a question for you guys. So why do you think tar flower is sticky? Uh, you can answer in the chat and I'd like to hear any of your ideas. It traps all sorts of insects. Good answers. Yeah. Yeah, so these are great answers. We actually don't really know why tar flower is sticky, but a lot of you hit on one of these, the biggest possibilities. It could keep the the keep um, animals from eating the flowers. Um, that's called florivory, an animal that eats flowers, and that is actually pretty tough to test because it's hard to take off the stickiness without damaging the flower, and that would be the best way to test this hypothesis. Yeah, um, so. It could be to protect the flowers from the harsh weather in the Florida scrub. That's one possibility. Somebody brought up carnivory. That is something that researchers have also looked at or at least speculated about since there hasn't been much research on it. There isn't a ton of evidence for this, but, the, but it could be happening to a small extent since the petals fall pretty quickly. It's unlikely that that's the main reason that the stickiness is there. Yeah, someone mentioned that the predator of the pollinators can't get to them. That's a really good answer that I'll talk about a little later too. So one other reason is that it could keep animals from stealing nectar or pollen. And that you could test if the if you could cover up the stickiness. And that is actually what my experiment is on for my intern project. I will be covering up the stickiness at the base of the flower with sand. And this should allow crawling insects such as ants to crawl up the stem and onto the flower and get at the nectar and pollen that, is, that they wouldn't be able to access normally. And so the crawling insects having access to the flower could affect it in multiple ways. These insects could scare away the pollinators. They could also be predators of pollinators like somebody mentioned. Um, they could damage flower parts. There's a lot of animals that will eat flowers, petals or other flower parts. They could drink a lot of nectar and leave little left for the pollinators. And all of these things could reduce the number of seeds that the plant can produce. So that's my project. I'm really pleased to see what we find and look out for a tar flower this spring. Look for those hairy stems and the sticky petals and try and find some insect stuff to them. Thank you and happy flower hunting. Thank you, Lily. That was really interesting. I love tar, tar flowers and, I, and I've definitely seen insects 
stuck on them before. I'm eagerly awaiting to see them bloom because we're, they're one of the prettiest flowers out here for sure. I've got our last flower we're going to look at, at the, on the trail. For this one though, we need to put our gopher tortoise hats on. We need to pretend that we're gopher tortoises and go down, down, down to the ground here in order to get a real sense of how cool this plant is. So imagine you're a gopher tortoise and you're, you're coming around down here looking for something to eat. Now you can't jump up and, and eat an apple off of a tree, plus we don't have hardly any apple trees in Florida. I'm definitely not in the scrub. Uh, but you can reach an apple called the gopher apple, which is actually totally different than an apple. But it's what we have right here. So these, these plants right here, they're flowering right now. Well, some of them are still in, some of them are still budding, but there's, they're pretty small. This one right there has a really pretty little white flower on it. The gopher apple is not going to get much taller than this. In fact, that All right, let's see if Dustin can come back uh, after our third poll. All right. How many federally endangered species are found on the Lake Wales Ridge? A, one, two, I'm sorry, B, 11, C, 21, or D, 31? And we'll have Lexi answer this one. Uh, give it a couple more seconds. Oh man, we're having, it's in between two, 11 or 21. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end the polling. It looks like B and C uh, are pretty much equal, 40 and 38% of people say that, so. All right, Lexi, what, what is it? All right, hi again, everyone. So the answer is actually 21. There are about 21 federally endangered species at Archbold. Um, however, there are about 40 rare and endemic species total. So, rare and endemic species, these, these are species that are found only on the Lake Wales Ridge and nowhere else in the entire world. So they're not necessarily endangered yet, but they're at risk for becoming endangered or threatened in the future. And can anyone guess why? Show me in the chat. Not necessarily trappers, but you're on the right um, right track. Yes, Kathy got it, habitat loss. So the main reason that all of these plants are at risk is due to humans getting, or humans taking the land from the Florida scrubs. So habitat loss and habitat fragmentation um, are the main cause of that. The Lake Wells Ridge is the central ridge in Florida. So it's the, uh, large ridge of land that's up higher than all the other land surrounding it and it encompasses Orange, Polk, and Highlands County for those of you who are asking. All right, thank you very much guys. All right, so it looks like we're still waiting for Dustin. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at our Q&A, and I'll have Lily and Lexi, if you can come back, turn your videos and mute, uh, unmute yourselves, and also Eric Menges, if he's available, uh, so that we can start our Q&A, and hopefully Dustin comes back in. Okay, so let's see, the first question, why do beetles live so the question is from Zeke, why do beetles live there? And I think he's asking, why do beetles live on the prickly pear cactus? Can any of you guys right, answer so that one? 
Sure. Um, I actually know a little bit about this. So that beetle actually eats the um, the skin of the prickly pear. So they um, are right under the first layer of skin and they eat the second layer of skin that's on the prickly pear. So they munch away at that. Cool. Thank you. All right. Next question is also from Zeke. Good job, Zeke, asking all these questions. Uh, can people eat the berries? And I think he means on the salt palmetto that Dustin was talking about. So these berries are edible. They don't taste good, um, but they act, we actually do have a big problem in Florida with um, berry pickers. So these berries are somewhat prized as a, um, a natural remedy for certain ailments. And there's no proof that they necessarily work. However, they are like sold in stores as supplements and things like that. Cool. Our next question is from Lori Hunter. What are those bugs on the crickly pear bloom in the picture? Uh, let's see what picture she was talking about. I think I had it. There we go. Those bugs on the screen share. I can answer that I'm not sure. one moment, one moment. Um, I believe it's a type of longhorn beetle, and oh, I wrote yeah. it down, but I can, I'm looking it up one moment. It looks like a type of longhorn beetle. I know <laughs> Mark would know that one. Um, ah, then. <laughs> hey, so we're just uh, doing some of the Q&A uh, while we okay, were waiting cool. for you. I want to show you uh, one more thing here with this gopher apple that I was about to show you before I got cut off. The other thing that I, that's really cool is that these are clonal plants. So if we look down, they're not very tall, but all of these gopher apple we see right here are probably from the same seed, all one plant. Clonal plants, they, they grow from seeds, but they also spread underground and pop out in new places. All of this gopher apple here is likely from one seed, and it just keeps on going. It just keeps on going right down the trail. This is even more of it down here, even more of it. That's just too cool not to show. So I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to do that. Uh, I know we've got some Q&A questions, but since my camera, oh, am I unmuted? Yeah, I know we've got some Q&A questions, but since my camera is back, I just want to finish up with a couple of things. When we do tours out here for our, for our field trips, we like to finish off with the scrub pledge. The reason we take a, a pledge to help the Florida scrub habitat is that this habitat is an endangered habitat. There, there has been a lot of habitat loss in this area. The Lake Wales Ridge, which is, Archbold is located on the south end of and goes up to right nearby Orlando, about 116 miles long, about 85% of the natural habitats on that ridge are gone. The Florida, the scrub pledge is to tell at least two people about the Florida scrub. It's pretty simple, but the way I think of it is like this. One of the problems is that people have never even heard of this habitat. So if you want to take the scrub pledge with me, raise your hand. You can actually raise your hand in right on Zoom. <laughs> There's a hand raising feature. I pledge to tell at least two people about the Florida scrub. Thank you. If you have any other nature or conservation pledges you want to make, type them right in there on the chat. I'll make another one for myself. I pledge to help gopher tortoises cross the road. I'm not going to jump out in the middle of a busy highway to do that. I have to protect myself. But if I can stop and help a tortoise that's trying to cross the road, 
I can help it get to the side it's moving to, I'm gonna do that so it doesn't get run over. So if you have your own pledge, type it right in there. Maybe your pledge is to recycle or not to litter, or you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to help the environment. Tomorrow is a big day for the environment. Tomorrow is Earth Day. In fact, it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day where people around the whole world are celebrating our, our Mother Earth that we have so much to be uh, thankful and grateful for. What we're doing tomorrow is two things. We're, put, we're putting out a video in the morning on YouTube and Facebook called The Colors of the Florida Scrub. It's a short two minute video of beautiful uh, film work showing flowers, blueberries, the different things that are out here in the scrub. And if you have been feeling anxious lately or stressed out, this is exactly the kind of video you're looking for to get back in touch with nature and to, to, feel, to feel those good uh, vitamin N, vitamin nature, to feel that uh, for yourself. In the afternoon at 3.30, Inspired by our Colors of the Scrub theme, we have a, a panel discussion. I'll be moderating it with a variety of our Archbold researchers. It'll be an hour long. That's geared mostly for adults. They'll be answering questions about research at Archbold and conservation and just celebrating Earth Day. I know we started the Q&A, so let's get back to it. Megan, you wanna jump back in? Uh, was there a question you were about to get to? Sure. Um, so one of the questions, if Lily and Lexi want to come back on and Eric, uh, one of the questions was if the, uh, is the gopher apple edible? Yeah, it, it tastes is. good. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not amazing, but you know, it's, I've, I've had it a few times. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, Eric is our, the director of the plant ecology. Oh, did we lose him again? Oh, he was about to say, Dr. Eric Mengi is the director of the plant ecology lab. Um, so if he wants to get on here and help, that's cool too. Uh, but I'm just going to keep going with the questions here. Let's see. Uh, how many wildflowers are at Archbold, asked Levi. So all of the, oh, does Eric want to answer this one? Sure, there's uh, of flowering plants. There are, um, I believe approximately 350 species of flowering plants at Archbold, plus or minus. Awesome, wow, that's a lot. So our next question, Let's see here. How many gopher tortoises live in Archbold? Hmm, that's a herpetology question. <laughs> Let me try to find a one that maybe you guys could answer. Let's see, what part of gopher apple plants do tortoises eat? Flowers or fruits or both? Um, they eat kind of the whole plant from what I've observed. They eat the leaves, stems, um, pretty much right down to the base from what I've seen before. Okay. They eat the, they eat the fruit of the plant and there's a hard uh, seed in the fruit. So when they, uh, when they poop the fruit out, uh, uh, half an hour later, they've dispersed the fruit to a new place. So the gopher tortoises are helpful to the gopher apple in moving seeds around. Awesome. And Lori Hunter asks about clonal plants. And she asks, is that what aspens are too? Yes, aspens are, are clonal plants. Some aspen clones cover, uh, west cover many, many acres and the clones may be thousands of years old. Uh, we don't know how old the gopher apple clones are, but as Dustin pointed out, they can be uh, pretty large and you see them along roadsides sometimes in places that get mowed because the mower goes right over the gopher apple and gives it an advantage over. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, another question is, has the gallberry started blooming down in central Florida? Oh. 
Maybe Eric knows that one, maybe. Uh, I haven't noticed it yet, no. Okay. All right. Uh, the rest of these questions, let's see. We got one that was earlier. Uh, Kathy asked if the beetles harm the cactus, the cochineal beetles. Um, they are parasitic. Um, in when there's just a few beetles on one cactus and the cactus is pretty big, it doesn't seem to harm them that much. However, if the infection gets really, really bad or extreme, it can weaken the plant and in extreme cases, kill the cactus. Okay. Uh, is, and Judith asks, is there any way to revitalize a scrub area once it is cleared? This is something that uh, many people are trying in former uh, pastures and citrus groves um, by planting seeds and by growing plants in greenhouses and planting them out. But it's very difficult. Um, a lot of the scrub plants are very old. Um, salt palmettos can live for thousands of years. And so although you can start a scrub uh, with plants and with seeds, it's gonna take a long time to, to develop into a mature scrub. And in the meantime, it, it's, uh, it may be difficult to control uh, invasive species. It may be difficult to burn the scrub. So it's a real challenge to bring scrub back if it's been. Yeah, it seems like it takes a really long time. Um, so we've got two questions from Facebook, actually, which is really cool. Um, Mike Sawyer asks, how old is the gopher apple colony? Uh, no one's done any research on that, so I don't think I don't think we have a good answer for that. Okay, and Dylan Winkler asks on Facebook Live, do different insects pollinate scrub palmetto versus sub saw palmettos? They hear the train. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's me, the train. <laughs> We've got our train going past Archbold every day. <laughs> So did you hear that, um, Eric? Yes, I'm, I only have a vague answer. I know that uh, scrub, uh, saw palmetto has many more insect visitors than scrub palmettos. I suspect that there's some overlap in pollinators and some differences. And we actually have a data set that could answer that question, but uh, I don't have access to that right now. It's a good Mark Dayrup question. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, looks like we got to most questions. Yeah, and uh, real quickly, unless if Dustin wanted to say anything else, I wanted to talk about a fun activity that um, families can do at home. One more shout out here okay. to Cassia in California. We have a happy birthday to Cassia and also to Emily, whose birthday is tomorrow on Earth Day. Yay, happy birthday. <laughs> That's it for me. Okay, so I just wanna share, I'm gonna share a screen. Um, I wanna share a fun activity that you all can do at home. I made this fun bingo game and um, it's shared on Facebook, uh, but Dustin share this on Facebook and you can share some of your stories and pictures. And if you'd like, you can tag us and hashtag scrub bingo, but also don't forget to follow the CDC state guidelines, but have fun and it's out there and share your stories and, and pictures with us. All right, well, thank you, Dustin. Thank you so much, a huge thank you to um, all of you participants and to Dustin for going out and exploring the scrub and Lexi, Lily for sharing their experience and knowledge with us as well as Dr. Eric Minges for coming on and helping us with our Q&A today. Uh, we're all signing out and hope to see you next Tuesday. Thanks, Bye everybody. Stay safe.